Good evening, everybody. We're going to wait a couple more seconds before we start just to let everybody enter from the waiting room. Okay, Brad, are you ready? Yes, I am, Stan. Alex, are you ready? Oh, yeah, let's go. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for watching tonight. Alex Cook, Brad White, and I all work together at the North Sales Northeast Loft, which is in Salem, Mass., north of Boston. Brad and Alex will be presenting tonight. Brad grew up in Cohasset, Mass. He graduated from Boston University, and he's worked in the sailing, in, in the sailmaking industry for 35 years. He's got extensive knowledge of pretty much everything there is about sales, materials, construction, repair methods, and design work. Alex is the nipper in our loft. He graduated from Boston College in 2013. He's worked in the sailing industry, in the sail making industry since he graduated. He sails a wide variety of classes from dinghies to keelboats. He's a team racing enthusiast, and I love to see that he still owns a Vanguard 15. <laughs> So um, I will turn it over to Brad. Oh, I should mention that um, after this is over, it will be republished on the North Sales YouTube channel. And um, please ask questions during our live chat at any time. Um, we may not be able to get to all your questions. And if we don't, you can email any of us to um, ask them after we're finished here. So let's turn it over to Brad and Alex. Absolutely. Thanks, Stan. Thank you, Stan. Uh, Welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's, uh, we're happy to be able to do this as we all get ready for spring and try and get our boats ready. Um, I've been really lucky to have been in the boating world all my life, almost always. And uh, I've had a lot of boats that I've worked on, including dinghies up to my currently that I own a Pearson 33. And it's been a great learning experience. I'm a a little bit of a nutcase board. I just love tinkering with boats, so it is a lot of fun. So what we're going to kind of go over tonight is a lot of the things to help us prevent this potential disaster from happening to us. Uh, we do not want to end up with our boat sinking out from underneath us and uh, being towed. Hopefully everybody in this boat is safe, but what a disaster. Wow, she's really foundering. So we're going to go through things from the tip of the mast all the way down to the bottom of the keel. Uh, there are so many bits and parts, we probably won't get to all of them, but we will run through it. And as Stan said, fire off some questions, we'll get to some of them, but we have a lot of information, so we're going to roll right ahead. Uh, obviously, this is a picture of a spar, and I put this out here because it does a couple of things. It, first of all, it shows that uh, if it's stored outdoors, there's a good chance that the spar will uh, corrode, even oxidize. You can see at the very base here where the paint or the anodizing has come off the, the bottom of the mast. Uh, it's not very good and uh, can take a lot to clean it up. If your mast is stored outside, you'll, uh, it's very important to check the groove that your sail slides go into so that you can tell if that's clean. Uh, we sometimes see masts that have been painted very diligently and uh, that's fine, but if the groove gets painted, then there's a chance that that may take up enough space to make your slides a little bit sticky. If your mast hasn't been painted in its original condition, uh, it's a wise idea at this point during the off season, if you can access it, to spray some dry lubricant up and down the track so that your slides will slide a little bit more easily. Clean off any mold or algae, anything like that that's on the mast, and then polish it. Uh, the polish will do a lot to help protect the mass and keep it from corroding. Very, yeah, very, very important. Yeah, Brad, I think uh, one thing a lot of people do is uh, come, come springtime when they're around now uh, thinking about going sailing for the season, they start to do the cleaning and buffing and everything like that. But one thing it's important to do is uh, in the fall when you take your rig out, it's important to uh, give it a good cleaning and everything like that so that all the uh, rusting and corrosion and the uh, um, salt damage can get off of it just before, um, so it's not sitting for four or five months with the uh, salt yeah. uh, corroding at all the fittings and the sprues and everything like that. And come springtime, if you do that a couple, several years in a row, you'll definitely be able to see the uh, corrosion wear setting in. So it's, you gotta 
the mass is part of the uh, winter winterization process. I know a lot, obviously you do that with your engine and things like that, but it's important to do that with your uh, rig and your spars. It's, yeah. it's part it, of the winterization checklist. Yeah, and it is really important as you take the boat apart. If you're inclined to do it, if you're doing it on your own, it's a great idea to, that's a great idea and a good opportunity to look at everything. Look at everything and get a little bit ahead of it. Uh, the next slide shows a mass that was put away improperly. <clears throat> and you can see number one, starting at the head, how the crane area of the mast is showing some corrosion around the mast. Uh, certainly the shrouds and the halyards are a mess. Uh, the guy <laughs> to the left of this mast, I don't know if it's all part of the same mast, but that rigging is a wreck. The other thing here that's good to notice is that you got an aluminum mast sitting on a set of steel sawhorses. And we know that aluminum and steel don't like each other. So at least put a pad between the two. Uh, and also, if you're storing outside, if you have the opportunity to at least cover the rig one way or another so that the weather doesn't get to it. I believe this is down south. It looks kind of like a pine tree in the background. So the sunlight's bright. It's going to rot the halyards. And you're going to have to replace your gear more quickly. It's just bad policy. Yeah. Brad, what do you if recommend you... for a cleaning agent for a uh, aluminum spar? Um, you can get aluminum polish, uh, which works pretty well. It's a very super fine. Uh, you really don't want to use a coarse abrasive. This is a fine polish, and it will clean it. Um, this little scrub brush with some soap and water and stuff is a good direction to go to start with. Get rid of the big loose stuff first, and then take it from there. It takes time. And going back to what Brad was saying uh, just a moment ago about the halyards and the rigging, well, if you can't get it, get your mast stored in a place that's covered, um, at least you should be, uh, you can take your shrouds off, but also um, put a mast line in for your uh, running rigging, like your halyards and things like that, just so they're not cooking away all uh, winter during the, um, in, in the sun. Yeah, and I, as Stan, uh, as, uh, as Alex said earlier today, uh, it costs less to replace a messenger line than it does to replace that nice piece of 5 8 or whatever braided line you're using for a halyard. So if you don't take your mask down for a winter, it's really, really good to be able to send somebody up in a good bosun's chair and they really can spend their time hoist the person all the way up if they can to uh, really examine the connections of the spars and the, the spar and the shrouds, the forestay, the backstay. Um, one thing you don't want to do, but I have done it, is uh, I was actually up a mast uh, fixing a, a shiv box down in Bermuda and I climbed out of the bosun's chair at the top of the mast and that way I was able to look at the top of the mast rather than up at it. Uh, I'm kind of lucky I'm not afraid of heights, but uh, it kind of blew the mind of the boat owner. But it gave me a good opportunity to really look things over and I found that in fact the shiv box, the reason it was tearing through halyards was had been cut by the old wire halyards, like, almost like a tin can. It was crazy. Uh, we should have looked at that before we even went to Bermuda. But anyway, we, we uh, lost a couple of halyards. We did get to the island and I was able to fix it. The other thing you can do when you go up the mast, just one sec, is it re really kind of requires going up twice. First time you go up, you come down, you check the, the shroud connections, cotter pins, clevis pins, uh, and all those sort of uh, locations. You check your uh, shivs if you can, all the way down to the mast, check your spreaders. We'll get to that in a little bit. We got a couple more things to talk about there. And all the way down to the base. And then go up the mast again and tie a line around you and your bosun's chair to the forest day and slide down the forest day and check every single connection because the connections uh, will get loose over time. And more times than I want to recount, people have come into the boatyard in, in the fall and they go to lower their headsail and the top swivel gets caught on one of the connections. And so not it's, only it's really the, important. Not only with that is uh, from a sail making perspective, when you bring your sails into the loft um, during the winter for a service check over and things like that, once we roll out that headsail, we can pretty much uh, tell instantly that the uh, joints in your uh, forest air are a little bit loose, the screws and just the wiggling from the force day uh, both leaves a uh, oxidized stain along the uh, luff of the sail every uh, five to seven feet based on the joiner, but also eventually just the chafe through the where the uh, 
points are pivoting will uh, chafe through the uh, luff tape itself and start to tear the luff tape and then eventually sometimes even the sail itself. Yep. Yep. So Brad, is this at least an annual inspection going up the rig if you're not oh, taking yeah. it down? At least annual. At least annual. Here's, you know, years ago I was uh, delivering a Bermuda 40 down from Maine and uh, luckily I got up early to uh, hoist the anchor and uh, while I was up there I looked and lo and behold in the stem of the boat were little bits of a cotter pin. So I immediately started looking around and lo and behold, the cotter pin that held the clevis pin into the forestay was dissolved, it was broken. And so that's something we could have lost the rig. Uh, but that's, you know, it's this minuscule investigation kind of going on all the time. So up and down the rig. Here's a, this square rigger rig is obviously big, it's very complicated. Uh, and there's a lot here to check on. It's a full-time job for several people. And, you know, in the old days, they used to tar these rigs to protect the rigging from the sun. So the sunlight back then, today, it doesn't matter. It really will wreck your gear. So we don't have spars like these, but the next slide will show slides, spars that are much more typical of what we normally see. And I think, I think uh, Alex has a couple comments to make about the spreader tips on these spars, which look really nice, but Alex? Yeah, there's a number of things to be uh, checking throughout these spars. Part of it's the spreader tips. Um, you can see um, most, if not all, of the spreader tips don't have any sort of protection along them. Even if they're uh, sanded down and uh, filed real nicely, it's still important to have um, some sort of covering piece, whether it be uh, tape, a chafe protective tape, or even uh, just a rubber spreader boot, just because no matter what, um, you're going to be able to protect your sails that way on all the sails in the inventory, whether it's your uh, upwind Genoa when you're trimming hard and there's going to be some chafe um, and contact between the uh, leech of the Genoa and the uh, tip of the spreader. And just if those aren't well protected, you're going to be wearing through um, all parts of the sail and eventually tear through the sail. And that's going to cause you big headaches throughout the uh, process. And not only is that, it's important to check the uh, tips of the spreader, but all sorts of contact points. I know um, people in the past and we, we were, talking about this uh, earlier in the day, um, even just the uh, lights along the mast and any sort of fitting along the mast, there can be screws where there's the threads or might, might be, there might be a burr on the thread where it's a little bit sharp and just something like that can just cause a little nick. And once there's that nick, it can just kind of tear away like some sort of a, like, like a normal uh, set of canvas or cloth or anything like that. It's once there's that, uh, defect or not defect excuse me um, once there's the uh, tear in the thread it just can uh, go go by itself yeah the other uh, we had a mainsail that came into the loft many years ago and it had been sliced and we fixed it and the next year came back and it was sliced so we figured out that that sail in the process of their sailing they were actually when they were running before the wind the sails laid out against the spreader so i went to the mass during the off season and looked at it and the aft edge of the spreaders was just like a cut aluminum it hadn't been filed or anything so we mentioned it to the boat owner and the boat owner mentioned it to the uh, yeah, boat yard so they spent some time they got a file and they filed it down and smoothed it out end of problem but we can go continue and fix these problems with the sails uh, but let's let's really solve the real problem so let's move down from the mast to the mast base area and there are lots of things that go on here. But the point of this slide here is to get us to think about all these blocks and cleats and fair leads and so on that are attached into the deck. And when you're rigging your boat, when you're taking it apart in the fall, it doesn't matter. You should take all these fittings and just check them all to see if they're actually tight, if they're fastened down tight. If there's any wobble in them, they will eventually break the seal with the deck and that will allow moisture to get in. So many boats have balsa core decks or some sort of a cord deck. And once that core gets wet, it gets weak and starts to compromise the uh, strength of the boat. So you wanna really, really take a look at all these bits and pieces in these fittings. The rails that you see, the grab rails, same thing there. Uh, if they start to loosen up, then the silicon or the gasket between the base of the handrails and the deck may become compromised, water will get in, and it just becomes a point of weakness on the boat. Also here, 
it's a good time to go through and start to think about looking at the boom. Same as the main mast is the mast. You got your gooseneck area, which goes under a lot of load. So, you know, look at the cotter pins, look at the fasteners, look at the bolts that hold it together. Uh, and certainly the bales that hold the vang system on, main sheet system on, uh, your outhaul. Uh, it's just critical to look at these items and make sure that they all function fine before you really even go sailing. Preferably in the fall when you start to take the boat apart. Yeah, absolutely. Or in, uh, if we could go back to that slide real quick, Stan. Um, there's a lot of good points there. Um, several things there. Uh, one thing, you can see the lines are a little bit tangled and everything like that and not necessarily a uh, fall or spring um, cleanup concept, but just every single day, day-to-day -day sailing, it's important to uh, make sure that you're cleaning that up both from a racing and a cruising perspective. If you're, if you're racing, if you uh, have those lines nice and clean and nice and tidy, it'll make your life easier during the uh, boat handling maneuvers. And if you're, uh, while you're cruising, it's gonna make your life easier so you're not yelling at your spouse or uh, bickering back and forth <laughs> about releasing any sort of lines. But like Brad said, it's important to make sure that the uh, joints in the um, installations are all clean and uh, not gonna work themselves loose. And even uh, just this fall when I was uh, take, helping decommission a boat, boat that's normally sailed by, a number of uh, very experienced sailors, when we were uh, disassembling the boom, we realized that the uh, safety pin on the uh, gooseneck had uh, wiggled loose. And so it's something that you might not notice normally, and it's something that you should be taking care of and just going an eye over throughout the entire season. It's not just a uh, fall and uh, spring checklist. Yeah. Now here's, we put this picture in because it's similar to the last picture but they've made a gain att game attempt at organizing their lines and cleaning it up. But there are two areas on this slide in particular. I'm gonna mention one, I'll let Alex mention the other. The first one uh, that I saw was the exit of the line coming out of the base of the mast. The, the white line with the blue, right, thanks Stan, uh, dot on it is coming out of that mast hole uh, and it's not a good lead. So it goes through that little bullet block and every time that line is yanked on, pulled up and down, it's going to chafe on that mast exit. Uh, most bar manufacturers make plastic fair leads that actually will help soften the turn or the curve. You may end up having to change that um, little bullet block for something even smaller so that it pulls the line closer to the mast. Don't know, but in this case, boy, I would, I would address that right away. That's you're just going to wear through that line and there's goes 80 bucks you got to spend just to fix that line. Another one is uh, it's a little bit more obvious, maybe, maybe not necessarily, is that you can see that Stan's highlighting there is the uh, crisscross between the uh, two lines right before the jammers, just based on the, the way that the lines are run from the, from the base of the mast to the jammers and the cleats, um, that they're tangled. And that's a pretty quick and easy, simple fix is all you just have to do is run a uh, tracer or a mouse through the jammer, um, detach, flip them over, and then run them back through. And that will reduce um, both the chafe between the two lines, but also ease on the amount of effort it takes you to tension the lines just because you're not working the uh, friction between the two. That's right. Absolutely. So fair leads are good. Got to have fair leads. Let's move right along, Stan. Okay, so when you're looking at all these fittings that are on the deck, um, and this is just a picture of a, of a cleat, obviously. Um, I'm in the process of rebedding the stanchions on my Pearson. And the guys in the yard said to, uh, they had they'd gotten some water migrated in. So I took a, uh, a drill bit and I put it in the fastener hole and I cleaned it out and I put tape behind it. I filled the hole with epoxy and a, uh, filling uh, compound and let it harden. Now I've re-drilled the holes. I've got bigger backing plates, but also in the process of drilling the holes, I countersunk them a little bit. I positioned the stanchions, drilled the holes, got through, everything's good. I put my bedding compound in place and I just tightened down the nuts and bolts moderately tight. So there's still silicon between the cleat, my stanchion bases, and the deck. So what I did was I left it kind of loose. 
so that now I can go back and sock it down. I didn't squeeze all the fit, fit, uh, bedding compound out of the way. So I'll go back and retighten it now, and I should have a good sound uh, connection between the stanchions and the deck of the boat. I'm really looking forward to it. Don't want to lose anybody over the side because the stanchions were loose or anything like that, which I'm going to back up a little bit too, because um, when I was inspecting the boat this fall, I found three of my stanchions had little tiny cracks in them. So up went the alarms, I took them off, had a gentleman re-weld them for me, and now I'm putting them back on. That's the beauty of inspecting the boat by yourself. Nobody cares more than you do. So if you can, take a look at it yourself. Yeah, and even if um, you're not someone who's able to able and uh, knowledgeable enough to not know how to do all of that uh, hardware work, um, like Brad said, he was even seeking advice from various people in yards and things like that. And they can point him in the right direction and just another set of eyes to double check to make sure that all the uh, fittings and everything like that are yeah. appropriately and uh, adhered to and uh, safe in that way. Um, no matter what, whoever's doing the work and whoever's looking it over, you can make sure that it's going to be uh, able to hold up throughout the season and keep uh, your crew and yourself safe. So here we got a classic old winch. Point of this picture is to just discuss quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on winches, but uh, again, this is on my list of things to do on my Pearson. Uh, as I listened to the winches last fall, I noticed that they weren't uh, making a clear, crisp clicking noise. That tells me that the grease that's inside has gotten dry, maybe dirty. So uh, I will be taking apart my winches. Um, honestly, uh, I've never done it myself. I've seen people do it, uh, so I'm not afraid to do it. Uh, most of the hardware in a winch is sort of self-contained. There are pawls, there are springs. I'm sure I'll run into some sort of problem, but eh, well, that's what it is, it's a boat. But it's really good to look at your winches, also make sure they're well bedded to the deck, and make sure they're spinning free and, and clear. What you can do is when you take the top off a winch very carefully, and then you can uh, take a paintbrush with some solvent or whatever you think is going to work best, uh, a good solvent. Get the old grease out. It will dry up over time. The uh, white lithium grease is a good grease to put to replace it, put it back in there. It doesn't dissolve with water. It doesn't gum up too fast. Uh, pretty good stuff. So uh, again, I'm looking to redo mine and get back to a nice clicking noise as the crew spins the winches. And just from an uh, in-season maintenance perspective, Oftentimes you see well, with smaller dinghies and things like that, that I'm more accustomed to, but also you'll see it uh, on the ramp or the hoist boats that come out uh, during the season, you'll get, they'll get a good, nice clean wash. Everything that's touching the salt water will get rinsed off and everything like that. But oftentimes with your uh, sailboat, you're not going to be doing that, whether you're a cruiser or a racer, you're not going to be taking your boat out and dry sailing it. Um, and so anytime you can get to the dock or anything like that and just give it a good fresh water rinse and moving yeah. parts like that and just yeah. get a good point of contact and point of attack with the fresh water on things like the winches and really make sure that you're giving them a nice good clean and whatever you can do throughout the season um, will help the maintenance throughout the uh, off season. Yep. So the whole thing here is because sailing is so much fun, uh, heavy weather sailing can be exhilarating, but be prepared. You don't want to have something go wrong. Uh, the primary reason for this picture is just to kind of point out that although it's kind of blurry, we know that the guy's shrouds aren't actually that thick where the Genoa sheet wraps around it. He must have some sort of a protector on there, which is really, really critical and helps prevent the Genoa sheet from being chafed through. The boat looks like it's uh, snugged up pretty tight. The lines are all, um, they're all coiled and secure at the rig, at the mast. And it looks like he's got the sail reefed, his mainsail's reefed. It's got to be blowing pretty hard because he doesn't even have his jib out here. Um, but keeping your lines under control, making sure there's no loose flapping things on the boat, uh, that's all stuff that can start to become a problem. And certainly if you can prevent the problem by securing things well and strong, then that's a good thing to do. And right, kind of, that's a really nice, clean, this is a well-organized boat. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was trying to uh, mention before when we were looking at the base of the mast, when we were talking about both your uh, racing and your uh, couple sailing. A nice, clean um, 
rigging at the mast like that for your halyards and everything, it's both uh, good in terms of communication amongst the boat, but also just a safety perspective that if things do go awry and it does get a little uh, sketchy out there in the big breeze, it's easy to uh, drop sails quickly and safely because you know that you can drop them quickly and you know the lines are going to run free and not get right. uh, tangled up as they're trying to go. And yeah. I mean, it's important to uh, keep those lines clean. And one thing I learned growing up, uh, I think I was in high school, my high school coach taught me it, it was uh, a tidy boat is a happy boat. <laughs> and this is a perfect example of that. Yep. So continuing on, uh, your steering system is, of course, super important. Uh, if you can get crawl around in the stern of the boat like I do and get a good look at it, make sure the, in particular that the shivs are in good condition. There's good lubricant on the quadrant. Uh, I, quick story here is I saw a CNC 34 one time in Boston Harbor uh, during a race. It was pretty blustery and people were lining up for a start and suddenly this guy is spinning out of control. And the long story short is that his, his uh, wire had jumped the quadrant. He had no steerage in a very congested part of the harbor. Lucky he didn't hit anything, but it sure did. Uh, you, boy, it was, it was loud. Uh, listening to people yell and scream, and this poor guy had no control of his boat. It was, you know, luckily nothing happened, so it was kind of comical, but yikes. I, I wouldn't want to be in that situation. How can you get in there? Is there going to be a hatch or an access point to see all this stuff? Yeah, I know on my boat, it's aft in the aft uh, lazarette, and you kind of got to stick your head in there and crawl around. It's never comfortable, and I'm not even that big a guy, but um, just got to make the commitment to get in there and really look at it. Um, yeah. It's You know, the, the best thing for me was taking the ownership of this Pearson 33. It was a mess when I got it, and I took it apart. From bow to stern, I took it apart, and I learned every system on that boat. So it's really kind of nice, you know, education knowing where everything is. And I've had to replace pumps and I've had to replace bits and pieces, uh, but I know exactly where the parts are and what the problem might be. It's a good thing to know. On, on other boats that just have a tiller, uh, of course, it's easy to check the gudgeons and pintles and the rudder head. Make sure all those stainless fittings are in good shape. They're not starting to crack. They're fastened to the hull in good shape. Uh, it's amazing the amount of torque these things are under. So definitely it's worthwhile to look at uh, and make sure that uh, they're they're secure. Absolutely. Yeah. And just uh, something that might not be obvious when you give it a good look over is the way that the pintles are uh, welded to the brackets that are actually attached to the transom of the uh, hull is that underneath, even if it seems like the pintle is secure, where the uh, rudder drop, the rudder gudgeons drop onto the pintle is um, where the way it's welded is it, you can see that the weld is starting to crack and um, become disconnected. And it seems like that for the time being, it will be okay and secure enough. But over time, that's gonna, the weld is gonna break even more and more. And then the uh, pencil will be just sitting in the casing, but not attached to anything whatsoever. And um, just with the amount of torque and the amount of uh, uh, load that are on those, it's important to make sure that you're taking the uh, preventative maintenance ahead of time when you notice those cracks start to form and just make sure that um, you're preemptively uh, replacing or re-welding those uh, points. And along with uh, the universal of the tiller extension, that's another point of um, uh, predominant wear as well. Right. So here, we're getting into, <laughs> so here we're getting into a little bit more of the boat hull prep. Uh, this was, uh, kind of what I did, I had a Bristol 24 a number of years ago, and this is basically what I did. I did what this guy's doing. Uh, he's smart. He's got a, uh, a mask filter. Uh, he should have on, really, a whole suit. He's also a good guy. He's got the vacuum hose system set up, uh, but he's got a big project ahead of him. But the point of this is to show kind of how bad it can get, and Stan, the next slide shows how good it can get. So if you really want to have a gleaming hull, you can pay Boatyard to do the work. Uh, I'm in the process of compounding and polishing top sides on my Pearson. It's a lot of work, uh, and but boy, it can come out looking so terrific. Uh, and I, being me, uh, and a proponent of being a do-it-yourselfer, this is a chance for me to look over the entire hull really, really closely. See if there's any damage that I uh, didn't notice last year, for instance, up around my bow when I was talking to one of the guys in the yard the other day, a lot of dings and so on in the gel coat. And I thought, oh, 
Well, the mooring buoy is banging against the hull sometimes, and uh, it's kind of annoying. So I'm, I, I think I might put a, a, a padded cover over the mooring buoy so it doesn't chip up my top sides. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about that. I can do it. Why not try it? Yeah, Brad, would this it. job be faster with a buffer? Yeah, it would. Um, and a good professional uh, guy who knows how to do it can do a really good job. But I, I feel that if your hand doing it, you can feel the compound, you can feel the wax, and the, the actual finish will come out better. Yeah, and even just when you're taking the uh, time and the initiative to uh, do the buffing of the top sides and you're noticing like the little nicks and the little chafes, it's things like the um, chafe from maybe even a launch or a dinghy for on the top sides of the, the college or the high school kids that are driving your launch through the summer and a little, a little chafe on the uh, side of the hole might make you look at the uh, stanchion that's right there and that, and that might have been affecting the uh, weld or the way that's mounted there and it just opens up your eyes to that much more detail where you're being so detail oriented on the top sides it just gets you in the mindset of checking over more and more parts of your boat. <laughs> and on to the bottom. We love this picture. This, I can't believe I found this picture. It's really pretty comical. Um, the guy in the end of the pier on the left side, he doesn't care. Uh, this almost looks like it's in Bermuda to me, but I don't think it is. Anyway, uh, bottom paint, uh, bot bottom preparation. Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about bottom paint because I think there are a number of good ones out there. Uh, I, I'm dabbling in some myself this year, uh, the process of application, the process of preparation. But this is a little ridiculous. I, I, this was probably a liveaboard. Some happy monkey was living on the boat and never washed the bottom, never cleaned it. So you put live aboard for a couple of years, not just one season. Yeah. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you know, take care of the bottom of your boat. Um, my brother used to work for a, a company that actually cleaned the bottom of oil tankers. Those guys figured that a mild slime on the bottom of a super tanker cost them 20% fuel efficiency, which is a lot of money, those guys. So let's just kind of scale that down and come down to your own boat and think about it. Uh, you, your boat is in the water from maybe mid-June, July, August, mid-September. And in my mind, you should clean the bottom at least once a month. Um, if you're racing a lot, you're going to want to do it more than that. Uh, but a good bottom paint, bottom paint seemed to be particular for particular water conditions. And if you find one that works well on your boat, then stick with it. Uh, it's a nuisance to change them from one style type to another. And it, it can be time consuming and it can backfire on you too. So talk to the people in your marina who, who have boats that you entrust. And I wouldn't talk to a fellow competitive racer. They may aim you down the wrong path. <laughs> but um, if you, Ask around, you're going to find from some people who have pretty good opinions about what works and doesn't work. And bottom growth is a real pain in the neck and it's not good on the bottom of the boat. Yeah, no matter what, uh, regardless of the type of sailing that you're doing, like you said, uh, the tanker you're going to slow down to uh, might affect your performance by 20%. Oftentimes with even just the cruiser, they're trying to get that extra little oomph in their boat and they're worried about their sail trim or this or that or how they're steering the boat. And like you said, even just over the course of the summer, that growth can really affect the uh, amount of horsepower and the hydrodynamics of the boat. And you see often on the race boats, they're cleaning their boats between every single race day, every single morning. And something that might not appear to be affecting um, the bottom of the boat with your bottom paint if you're um, wet sailing your boat. And if you give it a feel, you can really feel the um, gunk and the grime kind of starting to build up on the, on the um, bottom paint, even if it doesn't appear that way. And right. so, like you said, it is important to make sure that you're uh, either diving on the bottom yourself or uh, having someone do that for you. Yeah. One quick thing I'm going to mention here is that the uh, super slick bottoms are coming more and more popular. The theory behind them is to create a bottom that's so slippery that marine growth cannot attach to it. Um, but they don't come without needing maintenance. In other words, they do need somebody to dive on them. What I do know is this, is that there was a local guy who was cleaning a lot of boat bottoms. And he said that without a doubt, the boats that he dove on and cleaned the bottom that had 
super slick bottom coat of some sort or another were easier to clean and had less growth on them week after week after week. So it's, uh, it could be something to look into, especially if you race. Uh, it's more or less, uh, for lack of a better term, it's kind of like a polish going on the bottom of the boat, but it's not, not without needing some maintenance. So on this picture here, I, I put this one in because uh, as you do the bottom of the boat, as you're scuffling around underneath it, good time to check the propeller shaft with your, um, th this propeller shaft has no zinc on it. It really should have a zinc. Uh, in that, um, in the strut is the cutlass bearing. Uh, try and wiggle the shaft. If there's any play in there, it might be time to replace the cutlass bearing. Uh, I checked mine the other day. Um, check that your folding prop is able to fold and close properly. Uh, not a bad idea to kind of clean off any sort of corrosion that you see on there. Inspect the fastening, the connection between the strut and the hull, make sure that's not loose and wobbly. Um, and just generally let, check over the whole bottom of the boat. If you've got paint that's chipping off, you've probably got too many layers of paint on the bottom of the boat. Uh, and so you want to get, you don't want to have a lot of layers. There's, even on your house, it doesn't matter. You don't want a lot of paint on the bottom of the boat. This guy here is starting to apply the paint. And the kind of the thing I put here is uh, he's using a contrasting color, which is pretty helpful because if he's using a blade of paint, during the course of the season, he'll wa wash the boat down, clean it off a couple times. And if he knows he goes through the dark colored paint and starts to see the lighter green, then he's wearing through the newest paint. And uh, getting to a point where, okay, this is okay. We can suffer through the year, but uh, going toward next year, he might want to uh, throw another coat on. So what he's doing here is rolling with a low, low nap or a foam roller. <clears throat> and then what I would do, and what I, what I actually did on my boat was I had a friend with a paintbrush that had a little bit of paint in it and he tipped it out. So you roll in one direction and you tip it out in the other. And you always tip out from, uh, the dry spot into the wet spot where you've already painted. That way, when you lift your brush, it's a nice level, fared in sort of layering of the paints. It, it works. So really the tipper great. follows the roller, right, Brad? Tipper follows the roller. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yep. These guys are doing, they're having this fellow's having his boat done professionally at a yard. Looks like they stripped the bottom and now they're applying a barrier coat to help prevent any moisture from getting into the fiberglass laminates. Um, again, these guys are, are putting on, it's a fairly light gray, obviously colored paint. Looks like they've worked on the top sides. That looks pretty good. Bright works being varnished. You can see the blue tape up there. Um, and my guess is that these guys are gonna put on a contrasting color paint on the bottom. So again, they can tell when they've gone through the actual anti-fouling paint <clears throat> and gotten to the uh, barrier coat. You don't want to sand through the barrier coat or scrub through the barrier coat. And going back to that picture real quick, you can even see just the compare and contrast the uh, foreground versus the background, the two boats, um, one that has been painted and uh, one that hasn't. And just, it's important just to see that difference and uh, taking that into effect once it's actually in the water and just see that the, uh, the care that it does to the hull itself. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you, you wanna take care of things. While you're doing the bottom, what's really, really nice is to be able to check your through hull fittings. Bronze is better than the Marlon fittings. Marlon is pretty popular, <clears throat> um, but it doesn't, I don't think it's quite as secure. I had a friend down in Florida on his dad's boat, found a lot of water, water in the bilge, uh, alarming amount of water in the bilge. So he ran the boat up on the ramp and lo and behold, two of the Marlon fittings had let go. So uh, if they've been pretty far offshore, it could have been a real problem. The bronze fittings are much more secure, but they can fail too. Don't kid yourself. <clears throat> As you inspect them, <clears throat> you inspect them for uh, corrosion. You inspect them to see, if, uh, as I understand it, if they start to turn a very green color, they might be losing some of their strength. Uh, and I know on my boat that a year ago, I had a little bit of a leak at one of my through hulls. I couldn't figure out what the deal was. And when I, so I made a habit of always closing the seacock and lo and behold, at the end of the year, as I was kind of fussing around getting ready to winterize the engine, somebody at some point had put a plastic, like a plumber fitting on top of the bronze at an elbow and that just snapped off in my hand. So I'm really lucky that number one, 
I was inspecting closely, even during the season, and number two, that I was in the habit of closing my through holes. So the Marlon is uh, sketchy. A lot of boats come with it. It works okay, but definitely worth looking at. On your deck, as you're inspecting around on your deck, and I know I've got this problem, uh, you can just barely see on the cap for this fuel uh, filling uh, hole, there's a black gasket. And I know on, on mine, that gasket is cracked. And uh, so I'm gonna replace it this spring because I know that getting fuel, water into my fuel system is not good. So every time it rains, every time I rinse the boat down, every time seawater comes on and I'm, I'm splashing around offshore in waves, uh, there's a chance water is gonna get into the fuel tank and I don't want that to happen. Uh, kind of, this is one of these small, often overlooked little things, uh, but take a look at it. Check your boat out top to bottom. Engines, <laughs> we love engines. And uh, you may not have one that looks like this, but the cool thing about this picture is that this engine is sparkling clean. And this is going to be the emphasis of my, my whole little talk right here, is a clean engine. So in your boat, you've got an engine that's probably in a pretty tight spot, as most sailboat engines are. Um, this engine is very clean, uh, maybe a replacement installation. Uh, but when you look at your engine, if it's clean, you can see very quickly where there may be a, a, a screw that's loose, letting a little bit of lubricant out or cooling water agent out. Uh, again, on my boat, I had a little situation with uh, a valve and it, I was noticed this little bit of liquid was leaking down. You should know the color of your liquid. So this was a sort of a, a, a yeah, reddish color liquid. I said, oh, that looks like diesel fuel. So I traced it back and went uphill and there it was, was just a little tiny leader valve that was barely cracked, but hey, boy, it was just open a tiny bit. So by having the engine clean, and honestly, it's not as clean as I would like it to be, but having the engine really clean helped me spot that problem really quickly. So rather than pulling in air to the system, I was able to tighten it down and take care of it. And one of those things along with your uh, boat engine, it's similar to a car in the sense that you kind of throughout the uh, use of your car and the life of your car, you're going to bring it in and check the oil and make sure everything's uh, working in a sense. And maybe it, throughout the sailing season, you're not using your uh, boat engine that often as much as your car, but it's still important just throughout the uh, calendar to make sure that you yourself are double checking all the fittings, the belts, make sure that things aren't drying out too much. Uh, uh, and along with uh, double checking all yeah. the uh, mechanical issues are not gonna get themselves worse. Yeah, and even, even during the season, um, as you use your boat, you should be in the habit of checking the oil level, checking the coolant level, uh, checking the hoses, making sure nothing's cracked, nothing's pinched. Um, I know for one, when I'm sailing my boat, when I'm motoring in from the uh, mooring or whatever, uh, I can feel the exhaust to make sure it doesn't feel too hot. Um, just a habit I'm in, make sure that's running right. And I know that I've got to tighten my belts before I start the engine up this spring. Uh, I've got to replace my batteries. And so, yeah, it's just all the stuff. One thing that we aren't going to really go over, but uh, is important, it's not critical, but uh, your head, hot water system, uh, those are all things that, you know, have your boatyard, check them out. Uh, again, if a, if a pipe bursts or a hose lets go, it's a bigger problem during the season. You don't want to interrupt your season. You might as well enjoy the eight or so weeks that we're able to on our boats. Now we're going to get into nice. a little bit on the sails. And um, I thought this was kind of a funny picture because there's a lot of sails on this boat, but they've all got pieces and bits and so on and so forth on them. We do a lot of annual off-season checkover of sails. We look for things like sunburnt webbing, uh, stitching that's come undone, uh, sunburnt torn UV shields on Genoa's is huge. Uh, and no kidding, think about what would happen to you if you took your face and smashed it around some aluminum and stainless for a season, you'd probably be in pretty tough shape. So it's miraculous that our sails actually can do the job they do without as much problems. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. So we go over sails, all, all the corners, all the stitching, and make sure that hopefully our customers have no 
in season problems uh, while they're sailing. That's the biggest embarrassment. So we got a corner of a sail like this. This is the clue of a Genoa, obviously. And uh, you, we check the webbings. Uh, most newer sails don't have leather covers on them. In fact, a lot of the sails that I'm selling now would have not even have a stainless ring. They'd have a soft clue so that the stainless doesn't bang up the finish on a mast. Um, but uh, checking the webbing, making sure it's not dry and crispy, the stitching is good. If you scratch your fingers on the st stitching or the backside of a knife, uh, if the stitching starts to come undone, then you should get easier to get it restitched before it all falls apart. Yeah, and then and Stan, uh, Alex pointed out another one just this morning looking at this. Yeah, right where uh, Stan just highlighted, you can see where there's a skip in stitching, and that's just from the uh, sun damage throughout the uh, years of the uh, sail and the UV cover. You can see that the uh, stitching has been uh, compromised, and that just goes to show um, the purpose that the uh, sacrificial uh, shield of the UV cover is uh, the purpose of it. And basically, one thing that it's important to be servicing is that you bring your sail in so that the UV cover can be restitched as necessary. And then eventually, um, down the line, the UV cover can be replaced. And that way, the UV cover is serving the purpose of the sacrificial uh, shield so that your sail's not being damaged. And if you can see that obvious uh, thread being deteriorated on the UV cover, just imagine what that is doing to the uh, stitching on the webbing and just the webbing itself. And it might not be as obvious on the webbing, the damage that the, the thread is do the UV is doing to the thread, but it's still doing the exact same damage to it itself. And obviously the uh, webbing that's holding on the attachment point of the clue ring is uh, important to make sure that it's intact and will be able to do its job. The other thing on this picture, you guys, is that uh, you can see the foot line goes through those grommets is not secured, and that should have a cover over it. Lo and behold, that line, <laughs> it'll do the classic. You go to tack the boat, it'll wrap around like a little haggard cleat or something like that, and either the, this sail will tear or you'll tear that little flag cleat off the shroud anything like that. So that should have a little cover on it and it should be dead ended. So I'd even cut it off. I don't, you don't need that much line on there anyway. Can we clean that's up that. how those sheets are tied? Well, you know, that, that's what this guy has done. He just tied bowlins. Um, you know, that I think the bowlins are, they create friction when they go around the mast, but I think they're better than a cow hitch where you have a length, a, a leech line that's twice as long as it needs to be and you pass one in through the loop you kind of make. And uh, the cow hitches are secure, yes, but once load, they get loaded up, they can't be, they don't come apart. So they're really not a good knot to use. Bowling's better. Um, J-lock fittings or some sort of shackle is better, uh, especially if you're racing, you got to do something like that. I had a, years ago, I had a one design boat and I used to sew my sheets on because it made a nice clean eye and uh, passed around the rig beautifully. So you're sailing along, and this is what we want to do. We're trying to bring all this stuff to your attention so that your beautiful day of sailing isn't interrupted by a disastrous sail tearing or a, uh, heaven forbid, your rig falls down, uh, all kinds of stuff. We had a fellow brought in his, his uh, sails. He'd gotten a new boat because his old boat, while he was out sailing, the rig fell down. The insurance company totaled the boat. So... You don't want your mast to fall down. You don't want your rig to fail. You don't want your through holes to fail. Uh, so it's a really good idea from the bow to the stern, make sure that everything is intact, rugged, well bedded, cotter pins. One good tip you can use uh, with cotter pins, tape, always either tape, or if it's something that doesn't come undone seasonally, put a dab of silicon glue on it. Uh, that way, the silicon. Oh, I'm just going to point out one thing too. On the UV shield, if you go back to that other slide stand, <clears throat> the UV shield, what we've found is that the UV material will last about half the life of the sail. The sail, we figure, just going to pick 10 years for a good usable life out of a sail. Uh, well taken care of, it'll go 10, 15 years. Um, if you don't take care of it, you're going to be eight years. But the UV shield usually goes about half the life of the sail. 
the stitching usually goes about half the life of the UV shield. So three years in New England, UV stitching starts to show its wear. Five or six years, the UV shield will probably be, need to be repaired. And at the 10 to 12 year mark, you're looking at replacing the sail. That's pretty much the, the timeline. And like, and like Brad said, even just checking the stitching, uh, even just giving just a fingernail scratch on the uh, stitching that's exposed to the UV, if you can see that the uh, threading itself is starting to fray and you can tell that it's dry rotted and dried out, that just means that it's time to uh, bring your sail in for service and uh, have, the, have us or whoever you want uh, get the work done for you and just make sure that you're ready to go for the next season and just prolonging the life of your sails no matter what. Yep, let's flip forward, Stan. These guys are having fun. We want to avoid this. This is a disaster. Um, I personally think the problem was the color of the hull. Kind of an interesting color. International orange, distress orange. He needed it. So it's a good thing he got found. Um, but yes, Dan. Yeah, you know, I think throughout this presentation, we've been talking about stuff that's a time investment and somewhat of a money investment. But if you're not going to put some investment into your boat, you can have a big problem, right? It can be a safety issue more than, a, than just a performance issue, correct? That's right, absolutely, absolutely. So here we are, you know, you've had a great season, you're sailing off into the sunset. So let's uh, all try and keep healthy. Let's get our boats prepared. Let's get out on the water. I'm looking forward to sailing tomorrow afternoon, actually. And, um, you know, this is what it's all about. We work hard to enjoy our boats and, and we need to get out there and see the sunset. So the last thing we want to talk about was how to impress your crew. And by impress your crew, I'm kind of referring back to the old British Navy term of how to get your crew lined up, how to steal crew from other boats. Um, number one is you want to have a good group of buddies, friends that you can go sailing with. You want to have fun, capital F-U-N, have fun. You want to let your crew know what's going on, let them know what the plan is. This spring is going to be a little tough. I've seen suggested um, ideas on modified forms of racing. Uh, the Sail Newport crowd is talking about actually having more single-handed or family-oriented uh, pursuit races. Uh, that'll be interesting. The This year may be tough on fleet racing where people get eight or ten people on their boat for a day of racing. Uh, you know, I'm rethinking my whole battle plan just for fun, fun Thursday night racing because uh, as much as I like the guys I sail with, um, this is a pretty serious situation we're in. So we want to have good expectations. We want to have a seasonal plan uh, if it's cruising or if it's racing. Uh, and then you can line people up ahead of time. People who are looking to crew want to know they're stepping onto a well-prepared vessel. They want to know that you're safety conscious, that your boat isn't going to sink out from underneath them. And have you fun. Even regardless of that, just uh, the well-prepared vessel, um, once you step, if someone who's crewing for you steps on the boat and you're going for a night of racing or a cruise, if uh, things are starting to fail or lines are chafing or uh, lines are breaking through, it just uh, causes a bigger headache for everyone and then kind of de might deter people um, from coming back. And But also, like, like everyone says, the whole point of it is having fun, whether you're doing well on the race course or uh, what have you. Um, some pizza or some food or some soda or some beer after racing or after the sale will go a long way. And it's just kind of enjoys the camaraderie of the uh, sport that we all enjoy. Yep. A well-prepared so, vessel is a well-provisioned one, yeah? Oh, yeah. So on that note, uh, I started a thing last summer on my boat where we would leave the dock and then we had the barbecue growing on, going on the stern. We had sausages, we had steaks, we had all kinds of food. And I've already had some of my competitors ask me this year what I was serving up for dinner. And uh, we make no bones about it. When we get out to the starting area, we're fat and we're happy and we circle the fleet as everybody's booing around the committee boat and, and to make sure they know that we're cooking dinner. We have a good time. So you're out there sailing with all your crew, your friends. Uh, this may not be the scene quite so much this summer, but it is a lot of fun. And uh, maybe this will lead to this. <laughs> years and years of enjoyment on the water, having fun. Thanks, you guys, for attending. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're available. Call us, email us. 
Uh, we'll do our best to get back to you. This is a bit of a different spring. We'll all get through it. We'll all have fun. And I uh, can't wait to get my boat in the water and go sailing. So thanks again very much. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Brad. That was great. And again, um, if you tuned in late, this will be on the YouTube channel soon. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. All righty. Good night, everybody. Stay safe, stay, stay, stay healthy. Boys.